High school, my people, it is so great to be back with you this Wednesday. I'm Sam Crandall, the student pastor at our Mount Juliet campus, and I am so stoked to be continuing our Like Me series tonight. For the record, I really did enjoy high school. I have some really sweet memories from it, and some of my best friends today are from high school. And as I'm sure you are well aware, there are definitely some hard and challenging times too one of which was something I struggled with throughout high school, and that was that I would compare myself to everyone. People in my classes, girls on my dance team, friends in the relationships they were in, you name it, I was always saying to myself, if only I were fill in the blank. Especially when it came to boys. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily boy crazy, but I definitely cared what guys thought about me, and it turned into this never-ending cycle of comparison. I was always the fun friend, but never the pretty one. And I was very much aware of that. And at various times it consumed me and drastically affected my sense of worth. Maybe some of you out there can totally relate to that. And maybe others of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Celebrate that. Anyways, I found myself frequently thinking things like, if only I were thinner, if only I had nicer skin, if only I dressed differently, if only I posted better pictures at better angles, or if only the pictures I posted on social media made it look like I was having a better time than everyone else. But no matter what new standard I recreated for myself, it never felt like enough. Can you relate? You work so hard for what you think you want. You achieve it and then you realize it falls short. And then the cycle of if onlys restarts. If we're being honest, we have all felt that way at one point or another, and not just in dating. We carry that if only I mindset into our various aspects of our lives. Maybe we think if I do a stellar performance in this month's musical, my theater director will like me. If I can score the final touchdown that wins the game, my coach will like me. If I can get straight A's, my teachers will like me. If I don't break curfew, my parents will like me. If I go to this party and drink this drink, my friends will like me. For example, take your grades. Maybe you're self-aware of your intelligence, but in your mind, there's a certain level of success in this area that will be enough for a teacher or a guardian to approve. Or if you make it past that expectation of being enough, they'll be beyond pleased with you. Or take the extracurricular things that you're involved in. Maybe you're not necessarily the best player on the team or the best singer in the choir, but in the position or role that you play, there's a certain expectation you have for yourself. Or possibly a coach or director or teacher has placed on you that equates in your head to a good performance in that role. And if you can do what you're expected to do without messing it up, you'll be enough. That coach or director or whoever it is will be happy with you. This happens in so many areas of our life. We believe that success and great performance inevitably leads to being liked and accepted. If we're funny enough, smart enough, skinny enough, buff enough, trendy enough, fast enough, pretty enough, successful enough, and even Christian enough, then we'll be enough, right? But there are some serious problems with this mindset. First off, we compare ourselves to other people. We know the areas where we do pretty well and get close to the enough line, but we are also very aware, if not more aware, of where we don't measure up. We all tend to focus on the negative. I'm sure right now, if I asked you, you could tell me a mean thing somebody has said to you recently before you could remember a kind thing. Like in this moment, I could tell you without having to think twice the first and last name of the kid in my fourth grade class who made fun of how I looked. Crazy how the negative stuff sticks with us, right? We become consumed with the people who seem to be above the enough line in those areas, which inevitably causes us to compare ourselves with people who are whatever it is that we want to be. And since we feel like we can never compare to them, we decide that we'll never be enough. In other words, there is always someone who is better in whatever regard than us, which in turn causes this domino effect in our minds that makes us feel like we have to get better in order to be enough. And when it comes to comparison, we will never reach the end. The other problem with this mindset, we compare ourselves to ourselves. And we all have an invisible standard that we've created that we have decided we need to live up to. And as soon as we fail in that area, we decide we're not enough. Let's say you've lifted your heaviest weight set. Awesome. But now that weight set becomes your new standard, which means you expect yourself to lift that amount every time you're in the gym. It's like we've raised the standard for what is enough. You reach the enough 
line in your life only to find it that still isn't enough. So you move that expectation higher and higher, hoping you will feel enough the next time. Yet you continually find yourself dissatisfied. Everyone in your small group has felt en not enough at some point. Even the people who seem like they have it all together. It's one of those experiences we all have in common. And if we're being honest, there's this gross part of us that has a hard time liking the person who doesn't measure up. The person who isn't enough, the person who is us. Okay, that's the bad news, we got it out of the way. The good news is that what we're talking about today can be a game changer when it comes to the pressure every one of us feels. And we find this insight from Paul. Paul was one of the wisest teachers of the early church. And if you've been around for a minute, you've heard his conversion story from Saul to Paul. Talk about rewriting the script. After his conversion, he shared a ton of practical ways to follow Jesus and experience a great life in faith. One of Paul's most famous letters was written to the people at a church in Rome, Romans. Go ahead and open up your Bible. Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament right after Acts. We're going to look at chapter 12 of this letter where Paul says at the start of verse two, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now Paul's not saying don't mimic your friend's style or train like your favorite athlete. Sometimes copying someone's skill is a way of learning from them, which isn't a bad thing at all. No, Paul is saying don't get stuck in the same thought patterns as everyone else. Don't mindlessly take on the habits of everyone else. Paul is saying when everyone around you is doing something, you don't have to participate that. Did you hear that, all my FOMO friends? You do not have to participate in all these behaviors that reflect the world and not the king. Does everybody compare themselves to others? Sure. It's normal, but you can refuse to participate in comparing yourself. Does the media and advertisement do an excellent job convincing you that you're missing something? Duh, that's what they're being paid to do. But you can refuse to believe that these messages are true. Do most people spend most of their time trying to get up to that line of enough in all of these areas? Yeah, but you can refuse to participate in the enough game altogether. Paul is saying that you and I have a freedom to pay attention to the messages being communicated to us and to be empowered in how we respond to them. Next, he says this in verse two, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. This is huge. Paul is encouraging us to invite God into the way we think, to pay attention to what we are thinking and then ask God to be a part of it. We live in a culture where people feel like they're never enough. So inviting God into the way we see ourselves is a huge deal because when we invite God into this area, we'll realize our tendency to feel less than doesn't line up with what God thinks at all. And we only know what God thinks when we invite him into the way we think. Paul tells us to literally ask God to change our thinking patterns. He continues in verse two. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's will. God's will simply means what God wants for you. So when we invite God into the way we think, we are able to learn what God wants for us. And one big thing God wants for you is to see yourself the way he sees you. It's true, his view of you is perfect because he made you. Psalm 139 tells us he knit you together in your mother's womb. He loves you. He made you in his image as we read in Genesis chapter one, verse 27. You're the only one like you and no one can duplicate it. He's proud of you. And when he looks at you, you mean the world to him. You are his beloved. God wants you to see you the way he sees you. And when you see yourself as he does, you won't feel the need to continually pursue a better, higher enough that you've made up. Instead, you'll realize that you're enough today, right now. Here's a simple way to think about it. I can like me because God loves me. When we understand that we are made in God's image and that he assigns incredible worth to all of us, it should transform the way we see ourselves. Just like Romans chapter 12 verse two encourages us to transform our minds. Our worth isn't attached to us doing enough to be enough. Our worth is attached to being children of God. We didn't have to do a thing. God's already done it all. With that in mind, Paul continues a few verses later in verse six. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. There's another version, the message, which is a Bible translation that utilizes language that we are more familiar with to help us understand God's word. And it phrases it like this. 
let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. That first line sums it up. Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. And who are we made to be? God's children. And nothing you did or could do earned you that. If you can begin to see yourself the way he sees you, you can be transformed into something greater than a person who compares yourself to others. Think of it this way. God has an infinite amount of everything. Talent, intellect, skill, basically any category where we feel like we're not enough. God has plenty of it. And it's like he is saying, you don't have to worry about being enough here. I've got more than enough. What about of that area of your life that you feel like you can't meet your expectation of enough? God says to us, I am enough. Should you work hard? Of course. But whether you play great or have a terrible game, your worth doesn't change. You are not a bad game or a good one. You are not a mismatched outfit or a trendy one. You are not a bad mood or a lifetime of good behavior. You are my child. And your enoughness isn't dependent on how you play or how you perform or how you look. Your enoughness comes from me. Now, don't let this fall on deaf ears and seem like rose-colored glasses look on life. I know that it's not easy to believe and it's even harder to remember, but again, let our minds be transformed. Here are two ways to begin changing the way we think. First, invite God into your thinking. Does your current thinking line up with the way God feels about you? Here's a quick way you can find out. Tonight, ask someone, preferably your small group leader because they are a safe person, and start it off with, hey, I feel this way, whatever it may be for you. Am I seeing this the way God sees it? They'll be honest with you, but more importantly, there's a good chance you'll know the answer before you even finish asking the question. Just hearing yourself say it out loud can sometimes help us realize how irrational that little voice inside our head is. The second thing is repent. Repent is a churchy word, but the meaning is simple and practical. Repent means to surrender and turn your life in another direction. In this case, repent means finding new thoughts and messages to replace the old ones that have created the narrative in your head. Take those old messages that aren't true about you and find new messages about yourself that line up with what God says about you. Don't stay stuck in the old way of thinking. Start something new based on what God thinks about you. Some of you may need more than just you to reroute the direction you're headed. It may require the help of a friend, your small group leader, a parent, or a professional counselor, you name it. I know it seems like a lot of work to change the way we think, but it's worth it because our thinking literally affects every part of our life. Doing the work to change will take time, but the benefits will prove it was worth the work. Listen, it is possible to like you because God loves you, but here's the secret, you can't do it alone. You need other people to help you see yourself clearly. That's why small groups and small group leaders are so important. Imagine if this actually happened, if you could look in the mirror and like yourself. Imagine the peace we could experience and the freedom. You weren't suddenly smarter or better looking. It was the same you. You just thought differently. You just saw yourself the way that God sees you. Students, I'm gonna pray for you before we head on out to small groups. I'm so excited for the conversations that you guys are gonna have. Dear Jesus, we are just so thankful for the students that are together right now hearing this message, God. We're thankful for leaders that are pouring into their lives, uh, being that safe person that our students can go to, God, and they can have these conversations with. We pray for our students who don't feel like they're enough right now, Lord. We pray that you would just silence that voice, that you would fill them up with the promises and the reality of who you've created them to be, Lord. We pray for this time in small groups that it would just be conversations of humility, honesty, and ultimately freedom in you. Thank you, God, for making us children in your image. In your name we pray. Amen.